these moments as you hear the words that are going to be shared here. We absolutely trust that the Holy Spirit is breathing on these words, and right now they are life going right out to you to touch your heart because you need this message. You need this. We need this message. We all need this message. So, Heavenly Father, I just pray an absolute blessing on these words that you want to speak. This is your by your inspiration. This is the message you want spoken for such a time as this. Because there is hope for a broken heart. There is hope for a broken soul. There is a hope for a broken relationship. There is hope for broken brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, husbands and wives. There is hope because this message is he restores my soul. He restores my soul. So I pray right now as you're hearing this message that Holy Spirit comes upon you right now with a, 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 a baptism of his love right where you're at, that, that you will hear this message coming straight from the Father's heart. He's reaching out to you right now yes. with a message. He restores your soul. None of us are perfect. You know, and maybe you started off your journey. At some point, you asked Jesus to come into your heart, but life got in the way. Things got crazy. Maybe you got religious. Uh, maybe you became careless. In Revelations chapter 2, verse 4 through 5, in the, trans, uh, uh, in the Passion Version, it says, but I have this against you. You've abandoned the passionate love you had for me. This is Jesus talking. That's why it's in red. <laughs> but I have this against you. You have abandoned the passionate love you had for me at the beginning when we first started this journey. You fell in love with Jesus. You encountered him. You, you, maybe you were one of those people that were just completely stunned by his love coming into your heart for the very first time and what that felt like. And maybe you're one of those people that just kind of became a Jesus freak, as we used to call them back in the day, that ran around telling everybody. You want to tell everybody about Jesus because you were so radically changed. But he says, I have this against you. You've abandoned your first love. Think about how far you have fallen. Repent or return do the works of love you did at the first. Think about that. Think about that life that you started off with Jesus. He's saying, come back to that. Come back to that passionate love you had for Jesus. When you knew in your heart that he is who he says he is. And he did what he said he would do if you asked him to come into your life. And he did. But life happens. Experiences happen. Some of us experience betrayal, abandonment, neglect, slander, and all the other things that can happen in a person's life. And somewhere along the line, you lost Jesus. And you just don't even know where he's at. He is calling out to you, come back to me, return, repent. One, it says, therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and he will send Jesus Christ appointed to you for you. Repent, turn around, have another thought, come back, return. And he said, look, if you will do that, no matter what you've done in your life, no matter what you have 
done, your sins can be forgiven. They can be wiped away as if they didn't happen. You do not belong to your past. You belong to your future. Draw a line in the sand and return to the Lord with all of your heart and surrender to him. Absolutely surrender to him. And he said, if you will come back and say these simple words, and they're the most powerful words that you could probably say to the Lord. I'm sorry. Just to say to Jesus, I'm sorry for the mess I've made of my life, Jesus. I am so sorry for neglecting you, for ignoring you. I am so sorry. That's all he's asking for is just, I'm sorry. And he promises that he will wipe out your sins as if they never happened. He is the only one that can fix us. No matter what we've done in our life, no matter how hard we'd like to fix ourselves, we cannot fix ourselves. We can't. He's the only one that can fix a broken heart. He is the only one that can put us back together again. He is the only one that can put you back together again. He is the only one. There are those in professions that can teach you how to cope with your pain. They can teach you how to cope with your brokenness. They'll teach you how to survive in the midst of your brokenness. But no one can fix a broken heart the way Jesus can. And he promises, if you will return, if you will repent, repent means turn around, go back the way you came, go back to Jesus, turn around. He says, I'll send you refreshing from my very presence. Oh, the refreshing of the Lord. All of a sudden, love begins to come over you, a refreshing. Hope floods into your soul. Hope comes in that, that, that life can be better, you can do better. A refreshing comes. It's like a breath of fresh air that you can make it. You can survive. You can go on. He can repair you. And he and Jesus then comes to you with that still small voice. And you hear those incredible words. I love you. I forgive you. Welcome home. When you hear Jesus in your heart, say to you in that deep, still, small voice, I love you. I forgive you. Welcome home. That's where all of us want to go. That's where you need to go. Because we understand one thing, is that Jesus was taken up into heaven, but it says in continuing in Acts chapter 3, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. When, where are we at? We are in the hour and the moment of the restoration of all things. Everything that was lost in the Garden of Eden, it's time for restoration. All the peace that has ever been lost in this word world is time for the restoration of all the love that has been lost in this world is time for the restoration of love the restoration of peace the restoration of hope it is an hour and time for restoration to remove sickness hell and death it is an hour of restoration Amen. i can honestly say i know these scriptures, by these scriptures, we are in the last of the last days because this is the time of the restoration of all things. And he wants to restore you as well as restore the world around us to its original condition it was supposed to be in before sin ever came into this world, before death ever came into this world, rebellion ever came into this world, witchcraft ever came into this world. He wants to restore us to health, to holiness, to freedom, to joy. He wants to restore us before perversion came into this world. Sexual perversion, mental perversion, addictions, drugs, and so forth. It's time for the restoration of what is healthy, 
and whole for all of us. He wants to put us back together again. It's solid. So we know that uh, Jesus will return. He promised he would. But we also know before he returns, there's some very powerful key signals that he is sending so that we can know we're in that time. And one of those signals was the time of the restoration of all things. There's another cue for us to realize that Jesus is returning and he will return and we will all stand in front of him. And when we stand in front of him, we want to stand there blameless with great joy. He wants you to stand there blameless with great joy. Oh, I know there's people that said, you don't even know what I've done. There's no way God could ever love me. There's no way God could ever forgive me. I have done too much, too bad, too evil for too long. There is no way God could heal me, love me, or forgive me. You're wrong. That's a lie. And the fact, the fact is, as long as you believe that lie, it will keep you back from what he wants to give you. What's worse than believing a lie is acting as though it were true. That's even worse. True. But it's time for that lifestyle to stop now. And Jesus wants to restore you to health and healing and put you back together again. He wants to put your dreams back together again. He wants you to live the life he's created you to live. And only he is the only one that can do it. No one else can do it. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can do it. And I want you to hear my words. I am telling you, there is not a religion on this earth that can put you back together again. No religion exists on this earth that can put you back together again. I don't care what that religion is. It can't fix a broken soul. Jesus is the only one that can fix a broken soul. He and he alone. My invitation to you is not to join a denomination. My invitation to you is not to join a religion. My invitation to you is not to go to this church or that church. My invitation to you is to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and ask him to come and only he can fix you. Malachi 4, verse 5 to 6, is Jesus coming back? How soon is he coming back? Well, let's look at some more clues. It says here, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. When Elijah comes, and what we recognize, it's not the man Elijah that's being sent. It is the spirit of Elijah that is being sent to this earth. And what we're doing is we're embracing the spirit of Elijah and let, we'll talk a little bit more about this Elijah spirit here in a few moments. But let me just say this. That spirit that is being released, and for those that are embracing the spirit of Elijah in these days, he says, when that spirit comes, when the spirit of Elijah comes upon us, he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. What is happening in this hour is time for fathers and daughters, fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, mothers and sons to come back together again. What has kept us apart, the wedges that have been driven between fathers, sons and daughters, mothers, sons and daughters, those wedges, the Lord is coming to heal them and remove them and put us back together again so that children will honor their mothers and fathers and mothers and fathers will honor and love and cherish their children in a pure, loving, wonderful way. It is a time. It is time. It is time. And the fact of the matter is he is doing it. Yes, sir. He is doing it. We have so many testimonies, even our own testimonies of distance between father and daughter father and son, all that time that has elapsed in between in your relationship. Maybe you've been estranged from your relationship. Maybe you're a, a son or a daughter right now and you have good reason to be angry at your mother and father. And so you've broken off your relationship with them. You've put up a brick wall. Uh, you've maybe even spoken words of hate towards your mother and father. All that is doing is causing you more and more damage. It's about forgiving them 
and let God take care of the rest. Can God put the relationship back together again? Yeah, he can do that. Let him do it. That's the important thing is to say, you know, I don't know if I could ever be in a, a, a relationship again with my mother and father because of what they've done. But if they're repenting and they're getting their hearts right back with God, if they're coming back to a place of facing their failures, if they're weeping and crying alone in regret over what they have done to you as a child, if that's going on and they're coming back to the Lord and now you forgive them and you come back to the Lord, watch what he will do. He, will, he is the only one that can mend a broken heart. He is the only one that can put relationships back together again, but he's doing it. There are mothers and fathers that are facing the fact that they have failed as parents. They're facing the fact that they could have done better by you. They're facing those realities because they're facing Jesus because they want to be able to stand in his presence blameless with great joy. And he is telling them, you can't stand in my presence blameless with great joy until you repent and ask your children for forgiveness for the damage you may have done to them. You can't, as a child, stand in his presence blameless and with great joy until you forgive your parents of their failures. And learn to allow God to heal your own heart and then let him do what he is, wants to do. But I tell you what he wants to do. He wants to put families back together again. Let me say that again. He wants to put families back together again. Yes, sir. Now, we may not live in the same house. We may not live in the same city. We may not live in the same state. But he can repair the relationship with mothers and fathers, sons and daughters, and put us back together again. And there are so many testimonies that he's doing it. We just encountered that very same thing. My wife and I, Cheryl, just encountered that very thing just this week. A family being healed, relationships being repaired and put back together again. Jesus is the only one can do it, and he's doing it. And I, I have to be honest, I am in awe. I am in awe of what he's doing. We have all experienced broken hearts, broken dreams, fragmented souls to one degree or another. Who can put us back together again? I, I'm sure that every single person listening here can identify with the fact that there's a certain part of you that's fragmented. And it's fragmented because you've had a shattered heart. You've had a broken heart. And unfortunately, a lot of times those broken hearts have become because of loving relationships that turned against you. What was supposed to be love turned into hate. What was supposed to be protection left you vulnerable. What, what was supposed to, who was supposed to provide you safety actually opened the door for your own hurt and your own pain. And you have experienced, you know what it means to have a fragmented spirit, to have multiple personalities. I'm this way at this time, and I'm this way at that time. I'm this way when I feel this way, and I'm this way person when I feel that way. And so I've, I've developed all of these defense mechanisms to, to, to uh, make it through life because my soul is so broken, it's so fragmented. Who can put us back together again? Jesus is the only one that can put us back together again. In Psalms 23, verse 3, it says, The Lord, He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Jesus Christ is the only one that can restore your soul. And as you can see in this picture, this pottery is very cracked. But you'll also notice that running through it is the repair work, and it's done with gold. Pure gold has put this pottery back together again. Jesus is the only one that can put you back together again. The Lord's made us some very powerful promises. One of those promises is found in Jeremiah 15, 19. Therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return then I will restore you. If you return to me, I will put you back together again. No matter how broken you are, no matter how fragmented you are, 
no matter what diagnosis has been made over you in terms of mental illness or emotional illness or physical illness, no matter what is the cause of your fragmentation, the Lord says, if you return to me, I will restore you. I will put you back together again. All we have to do is trust him. Say, Jesus, I trust you to put me back together again. I'm going to ask you to say that out loud. Jesus, I trust you to put me back together again. Let's say it one more time. Say it out loud. I, Jesus, I trust you to put me back together again. And he will. And then he went on to say that if you will allow him to do this work, then you will stand before him blameless with great joy. And he says, then if you will turn around and pass it on, you now help somebody else. You learn how to extract the precious from the worthless because we encounter individuals that have, are so messed up. Life has so messed them up or they've messed it up themselves because of their decisions and their choices and their habits. They've messed things up so bad that we turn around now as he's putting us back together again, we can turn around and help somebody else because what we recognize is we look at these individuals and we realize there's something precious in every single human being. Somewhere in there, there is something precious because it is the life of God that is inside of them. He is the one that's giving them breath. He's the one that's giving them a heartbeat. He has a plan and a purpose and a design for every single life and it's beautiful and it's amazing and it's glorious. And when we can turn around knowing He's putting me back together again. I want to help somebody else find Jesus so he can put them back together again. So what we do is we recognize there's something precious in the middle of that worthless. So many people walk around and all people can see is how worthless they behave how worthless their actions are, how worthless their voices are. They see, all people can see is the worthless part of their lives. What they don't see or have the ability to see is that inside of everybody, there's something precious. But when you let him put you back together again, now you become a minister of reconciliation. You become a minister of helping people return to Jesus. Because you can see there is something pre there's something worth going after in every single human being. And if you'll extract the precious from the worthless, then what will happen? Then you become a spokesman for God. Now you become a motivational minister. You're motivating people to go to Jesus. Now you become that individual that can stand up with a message and declare that no matter how worthless you see yourself, there's something precious inside of you. And I'm gonna, and I'm here to tell you, I believe in you. I believe in that precious that is inside of you. And then you throw up a protest and say, well, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've stolen. You don't know the drugs I've taken. You don't, you don't know how worthless I am. Oh, but I tell you what, I look past all of that. Because in there, on the other side, in that, past that obstacle, those walls, that brick wall, all of that behavior inside of all that stuff, there's a beautiful, precious person waiting to get set free. And I can see it. I see it in you. And I'm here to help you understand how precious you really are. You've believed a lie. Not only believe the lie, you've acted as if the lie was true. And the Lord is here to tell you that it's time to stop believing the lie and start believing the truth about yourself. There's something precious inside of you. And what we have chosen to do is to be ministers of reconciliation, of the return. We want to be here to find that precious thing inside of that precious person inside of you so that you can get free of all of these distractions that have kept you from living the powerful, amazing, wonderful life you were created to be. Some of you that are listening to this inside of you is the capacity to speak publicly 
with great influence for good. Some of you have within you the ability to write books that have never been written. You have the ability to paint in ways paintings that have never been seen, sculptures that have never been sculpted. It's inside of you to do, but all this stuff has come to distract you and keep you from stepping into the reality of the person you really were meant to be. There are men that are called to be uh, incredible fathers, and you've been lied to. You bought into the lie, wherever that lie came from whether it was drug addiction, alcoholism, pornography, whatever the wherever it came from, to confuse you into who you really are, it's time to come out. Return to him so that he can put you back together again. There's a lot of women who have suffered at the hands of men, unfortunately, in such horrible ways. And you've come to believe lies about yourself. It's time for you to break out of the lie. Stop believing the lie and stop, act, stop acting as though the lie were true and discover the true, amazingly beautiful woman that you are. It's time to break out of the lies because there is within you something, someone that is so precious. And we're here to identify that precious person that you truly are and separate the true you from the worthless lie that you have been fed. Yeah. For uh, Jeremiah 30, 17 says, for I will, he, this is God's promise to you. I will restore you to health. I will restore you to health and I will heal you of your wounds, declares the Lord. Jesus is talking to you. He is saying, if you come back to me, if you will allow me, he is the master physician. He is the absolute ultimate master physician. He promises, I will restore you to health, no matter how sick you've been, whether it's physical sickness, emotional sickness, uh, spiritual sickness, financial sickness, psychological sickness, no matter what the sickness is, he is here to restore you to health in all of those areas, psychological emotional, spiritual, physical, and financial. He is here to restore you to perfect health. You are supposed to be healthy in all five of those areas. And he says, I will heal you of your wounds. Oh, but my wounds go so deep. How deep do your wounds go? Do they go as deep as that whip that came across Jesus' back that tore the meat from his body? His wounds he took those wounds so that your wounds could be healed. No matter what those wounds are, he promises, I will restore you to health and I will heal you of your wounds, declares the Lord. And that is Jesus talking right to you. He says in Hosea 6.11, Oh, Judah, he's talking to Judah. He says, listen, there is a harvest appointed to you. You have a harvest waiting for you. He's speaking to you right now. You can put your name in there. Whatever your name may be, uh, I could throw some names out. Uh, Josiah, you know, or, or Bill, or Dorothy, or uh, whatever your name is, you can put your name in there. There is a harvest appointed for you, and it's waiting for you. And that harvest is, is a, a, a gift of beautiful life, of enjoyment of peace, of contentment. There's a harvest waiting for you. Just put your name in there. When I restore the fortunes of my people, he wants to restore your fortunes, everything you've lost over your lifetime, whether it be friendships or relationships or marriages, uh, loved ones that have passed away, those that have even committed suicide. He says, I want to restore the fortunes to you. You can't fix that person that's taken their life but the Lord wants to fix you. He has a harvest waiting for you of blessing, profound blessings. It's waiting for you. It's waiting right here. Will you come? Will you turn around and allow him to give you what he's been holding right here? It's right here. The fortunes are waiting for you. Now, all you have to do is turn around, walk toward Jesus and say, Jesus, I believe that you can heal me and I'm here to allow you to do what only you can do. And he says, then I will restore your fortunes. You will have abundance of peace and contentment and rest and a good relationship, healthy relationships, family. He wants to give those all back to you, everything you've lost. 
and he is the only one that can do it. Only he can do it, and he will. In Psalms 51, verse 12, it says, I will restore the joy. He says, uh, he, David said, restore to me the joy of your salvation uh, and sustain me with a willing spirit. So David is praying, restore to me the joy of my salvation. I know what it was like to ask you to come into my life. Yes, Lord, you're right. I'm not living the way I did. I, I have given up on my first love. I am not walking in my first love anymore. I admit it. I'm asking you, Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. And then he's saying, and then David is wise enough to say this. Now, help me be strong with a willing spirit. Help me be strong sustain me with a willing spirit. He's relying on the Lord. He's saying, Lord, I don't know how to be consistent. I, I'm such a good Christian for two weeks, and then I go fall off the, then I fall overboard. I, I'm a Christian. I'm a good Christian for a month. Then I fall apart. Help me, sustain me so that I can live a consistent life that is changed and becomes solid once and for all, restore to me the joy of your salvation, O oh Lord. When we talk about the fact that Jesus will return, and he will return, and we want to be ready for him, we want to be, we want to be, uh, we want to be, have bright eyes, we want to have a smile on our face, we want to be healed people, we want to be restored people, we want him to receive the full reward of everything he did on that cross. But he also says there's another way that we can know how close we are to the return of the Lord. How close are we to the return of Jesus? Well, in Matthew 17, in Matthew 17, uh, verse 11, it says, He answered and said, Elijah is coming and re will restore all things. Who is this guy, Elijah? Well, first of all, as we said earlier, it's not a man, Elijah, that is coming. It is the spirit of Elijah. That spirit was so powerful that that man carried that John the Baptist came under that same anointing in preparation for the coming of Jesus. Who was Elijah? Who was this guy? The spirit of Elijah. Well, let's look at the spirit of Elijah for just a moment. He walked with God and he knew his voice. Elijah knew Jesus, God's voice. He walked with God. He knew his voice. He had a relationship with him. You need to have that kind of relationship with him. I want to have that kind of relationship. We walk with God. We talk to him. We know what he's saying to us. We know his voice. Elijah carried a powerful mantle for the supernatural defeat of evil. He met evil and defeated evil. He was authorized for miracles. And this is certainly that hour when we know the Lord wants to release miracles like we've never seen before. And maybe you need a miracle right now. Some of you are dealing with hepatitis chapter, hepatitis C. I just feel it in the spirit. You're, you're dealing with hepatitis C and the Lord said, I'm healing you. If you will simply open up your heart, reach out your hands, God's gonna touch you and heal you. Hepatitis C is going to leave. Uh, there are those that are suffering with arthritis right now. You're in so much pain and you're in those early stages and you know what's going on. Well, the Lord is saying, lift up your hands. I will heal you right now. And there's someone dealing with uh, appendicitis, uh, and it's not gotten uh, very, very bad yet, but the Holy Spirit is saying, I'm going to touch you and heal you of appendicitis. There are miracles happening on the other side of the screen right now in your house, in your living room, in your bedroom. There are miracles coming into this room right now. There are those that are deaf uh, in both ears. You're looking and you're reading my lips and somehow you came on this uh, screen and, and somehow you can't look away and now all of a sudden your ears pop open and you can hear what I'm saying. Yes, that's right. You're being healed because Jesus loves you. And within every single person, uh, there are those, uh, I, I just have a sense too that there are those that have been, you have been suffering from de depression so long, for 30 years, you have suffered with intense depression. 
and it's only a miracle that you're even alive having dealt with depression the way you've dealt with it. And the Lord's coming right now and breaking that depression Maybe off God. you right now. It's coming off yeah. of you. It's coming off of you. It's coming off you for the very first time in so many years you forgot what it even felt like to feel normal. He is the only one that can put us back together again. Wow, this is really, as I'm going along here, the other thing, uh, there is someone suffering right now financially. You are in such, you are desperate for finance. You are literally desperate. Uh, you need a, a great deal of money right now, and you're desperate, and you've given up all hope. You don't know where to turn. You turn to Jesus, and you watch what he does, how he steps into that circumstance and changes it as only he can, and he will. Elijah confront, confronted governing authority. When government acts in rebellion against the holy moral law of God, it is our duty and our responsibility to call it out. We must call it out because as his voices, we must declare what God has put in us to know what is the truth. And we are all accountable to the moral law of God. That's never changed. Some people say, forget about the Old Testament. Well, let me assure you that the moral law found in the first five books of the Bible in the law of Moses, that moral law, we are still accountable to. Stealing was wrong 4,000 years ago. Six Stealing was wrong. Murder was wrong 6,000 years ago. Murder was wrong. Cain killed Abel. Murder was wrong. That's never changed. Lying has never changed. It's wrong. Never changed. We're still accountable to it. And the fact of the matter is, we're accountable to morality. And that morality means that we live pure lives with our bodies. What you do with your body matters. And God has a moral standard and we, and we are accountable to that moral standard, such as you don't commit adultery. If you're married, you do not look at, you certainly do not touch another person of the opposite sex other than your married partner, husband, or wife. We are still accountable to the moral law. That's never changed. It's not going to change. What was sin all those many years ago is still sin today. Marriage between a man and a woman and sex within marriage between a man and a woman is the only place it is sanctioned. It is the only place it will be blessed. Anything outside of that relationship between a man and woman it comes under the judgment of God. I'm just telling you that has never changed and it's not going to change. Society might change. Society may say, well, this is now this is okay, that's okay, that the other's okay. And, and, and say there we're no longer accountable to live up to some kind of Bible, ancient, moral law. Let me tell you, you are still accountable, and you will be held accountable, and you will give an account of what you've done with your body one day when you stand in his presence. No matter what the government says you are still accountable. Elijah mentored and discipled his successor. I, I just wanted, I just felt this so strong this morning. One of, the, one of the greatest failures in our culture today, especially one of the greatest uh, sad things within the realm of, of those that follow Jesus, one of the sad things is we, are not, we do not see individuals willing to be mentored. People are not looking for a mentor. They're not looking for someone to disciple them, to help them walk out this life with God. That is such a sad, sad state of affairs. If I could say anything, if you, uh, as uh, any individual, I don't care what age you are, if you want to know more about how to walk with God, find a godly man or woman that you can trust. Be wise. Ask God to show you their heart so that you know you're following someone that's truly loving Jesus. And here's one way you can tell that they're truly loving Jesus. It is, it is the complete absence of selfishness. If you can find an individual who lives a life of what we call otherism, 
In other words, they live a selfless life, a non-selfish life. If it's all, if it's never about them, but always about Jesus and about you, then you might have somebody that has at least a little bit of, of that which you would want to follow. But one of the sad things in our society today, and especially those that follow Jesus, is we do not find men and women who have the maturity, the wisdom to understand they can get down this road a whole lot faster if they would find a true mentor that they could follow, that they could learn from, a, a, someone that can help disciple them. And that person that mentors you or disciples you, if they're a true follower of Jesus, all they're going to do is keep building you up, building you up, building you up. They're going to keep encouraging you to go higher, go higher, go higher. It's not about them wanting to dominate you. It's want them wanting to set you free. It's not about them wanting you to follow them as a person. It's about them wanting you to follow Jesus. And they're simply modeling how they follow Jesus so that you can follow that same example. That's a godly mentor. So Elijah had that. He was selfless and obedient. He did what the Lord told him to. Now, he was very human. He was frail. There was, there was certainly a time when he was susceptible to fear and intimidation. He wasn't perfect. He was a man. He was a human being. But he carried these incredible qualities. They were so powerful. They were powerful enough that Eli, uh, John the Baptist carried those same qualities as he prepared the way of the Lord. He was there walking under this same kind of anointing, preparing the way of the Lord. <clears throat> All right, Acts chapter 15, verse 16, again, it said that he's built, rebuilding, he's promising to re restore the tabernacle of David. And what we know about the tabernacle of David, it was all about worship, and it was all about act, that anybody could have access to the presence of God. You didn't have to go through a religion. You didn't have to go through ceremonies. You didn't have to do any of those things. You had access to God. That same embassy is what he's establishing around the world. Embassies as Treasure Valley Ecclesia, as an embassy where anyone can come and have access to God without going through the trappings of religion and, and uh, those obstacles that the world puts out there. Joel chapter 2 verse 25, here's a promise. I don't care how old you are, you know, whether you're 25, 45, 65, 85, I don't care how old you are. The Lord promises in Joel 2 25, then I will make up to you for the years that the swarming locust, the creeping locust, and the stripping locust, and the gnawing locust, everything you've lost, all those years, it doesn't matter how many years have gone by. He says, I will make up to you for all that lost time and I'll restore it to you. That's a promise of restoration. It doesn't matter how many years it's been. I'll make up to you. You know, I, I, I'm just quickened that there, there are those that, uh, uh, you know, this might get a little close to home, but, you know, maybe you've been working on a, a project for years, and it's just never gotten off the ground. Maybe you've had a dream about a business. Maybe you've had a dream about a ministry. Maybe you've had a dream about d doing something creative. But all these years have gone by. The Lord promises, I will make up to you for all those years of loss. Amen. That is a promise. And what did he say? I will restore your fortunes. I will restore your fortunes. I will restore everything you lost. He is the only one that can do this. And then he goes on to say in Isaiah 61, verse 7, instead of your shame, instead of your shame, you've been living under shame. I, I just can't get off the ground. I've just never been able to do it right. I seem to make a mess of things all the time. I can't keep a job. But Jesus has come into my heart. He's putting me back together again. He's putting my soul back together again. And now he says, now, instead of your shame, you're going to have a double portion. Instead, instead of your shame, you will have a double portion. Instead of humiliation, you will shout for joy over your portion, your double portion. Therefore, they will possess a double portion in their land and everlasting joy will be there. It doesn't matter how much time has gone by. The Lord is making a promise to you. If you will return to him, he will return to you. And he promises, I will restore your fortunes. But even more than that, instead of shame that you've been carrying for however long you've been carrying it, you're going to have a double portion. 
instead of humiliation, you will shout for joy over your portion. And therefore, in this land, you will have a double portion, and everlasting joy will be yours. Everlasting joy will be yours. It doesn't, you have not, do not think about how much time you've lost. Just think about what he can do right now. You return to him, let him put you back together again. Let him take the fragmentation, fix the fragmentation, put you back together again. And then he says, instead of shame, you're going to have a double portion. Instead of humiliation, you're going to shout for joy. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 12. Also, by the way, since I'm just thinking about this, do you realize what I've been doing this whole time? I'm reading Bible to you. I'm reading the Bible. I am communicating what the Bible says. And by the Bible is God's love letter to us. From Genesis to Revelation, it is filled with promises of hope. And I am reading to you all of these Bible scriptures. These are what this is what God is saying to you. We have put them in order as He has guided us so that you know that uh, you have a reason to hope. It says, return to the stronghold, O prisoners who have the hope. This very day, all of you that have ran away from the, the place of safety, ran away from God, return to the stronghold, the safe place. You who seem to be just prisoners of your own hope and you can't get free. He is declaring to you this very day, I will restore Double to you, double from what, double for your trouble of all that you've lost over all of these years. He is promising today, if you'll hear his voice and respond to him, he says, I will restore double to you. So when you think about how great and how high and how much you, you wanted to build, if you thought about the finance that God had promised you, you, you believed in your heart you were going to have this much or that much, or you're going to have this business, this successful or that successful, or you're going to create this thing that would be this great or that great. He's saying, listen, if you'll return to me and allow me to put you back together again, I'll double it. No matter how big your vision was, no how, how, how big you dreamed, he says, I'll put you back together again and double it. God did this to Job in chapter 42, 42, verse 10. Job lost everything. All of his children died. All of his wealth was taken from him. It got so bad, he had such bad breath, the Bible says, that even his wife didn't want to be around him. Dude, you need to gargle. You need to do something. Job was a disaster. It says Job was a disaster to him. He was... He was a disaster to himself. But at the end of the day, he never gave up on God. He never gave up. Through it all, he learned how to trust in Jesus. He learned how to trust in God. He never gave up. And he never complained with his mouth against God. He never blamed God for the hard life he was living. And look what happens. It says in Job 42.10, the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he, when he prayed for his friends. And the Lord increased all that Job had twofold, double portion. But look what Job did. See, Job, if he had one fault through this whole thing, he was self-absorbed. He began to focus on himself and how hard he, it was, what was going on in his life, all the pain he was going through. You don't know about my pain. You don't know how broken I am. You don't know what I've lost. You don't know what's been taken from me. You don't know what it's like to weep the way I've, I've wept over loss. But when he, God turned it around and Job took his eyes off himself and started praying for other people, he says, you know what? I'm going to find the precious in somebody else instead of being preoccupied with myself. I'm going to look with, for what's precious in somebody else. And when Job took that perspective and heard God speak to him and got a right understanding of who God is and who he is, got his eyes off himself and started praying for somebody else, searching for the precious out of the worthless in somebody else, then he completely changed. And guess what? He got back twice for everything he lost. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 13, it says, I will bend Judah as my bow, and I will fill the bow with Ephraim. It says, I'm going to take Judah, 
Judah means pray. If we'll learn how to praise, he says then, if you become a worshiper, one that praises in the midst of the storm, who prays in the, in the eye of the storm, if you're that one individual that learns how to declare, no matter what I go through, God is still God and I will worship him. No matter what I go through, Jesus, you remain worthy of my praise. When you take that position, he says, then I will take Judah, I will take your praise, and I will take Ephraim and lay Ephraim to that bow. And Ephraim means double portion. I will take Ephraim, which means double fruitfulness or double portion or double land. It means double, double, double. I will take Ephraim to your praise. I will take that bow of double portion, put it to the bow and send it to the bullseye and your life is about to change. We want the double portion. Hi, would you like the double portion? Yes, sir. I would like the double portion. 2 Kings 2.9 says, When they had crossed over, Elijah, we were talking about Elijah earlier, said to the person he was mentoring, discipling, Elijah's mentoring and discipling Elijah, Elisha, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what shall I do for you before I am taken from you? And Elisha says, I want the double portion. I want the double portion. We want the double portion. So we're going to pray here just in a moment. I want to pray, actually, let me, let me just pray right now. Heavenly Father, for every heart that has heard these words, yes. that are coming into agreement and positioning themselves to be that select arrow of double portion laid to the bow of praise, Lord, you promised you would give the double portion, just like you did Elisha. He received the double portion. So Lord, I release the double portion of blessing over everyone listening. Double for your trouble. Double for your trouble. Double for everything you've lost. Double for everything you have lost. Whether it's psychological pain that you've suffered, double blessing psychologically. Whether it's emotional pain, damage, trauma, I release double emotional strength, fortitude, and health into your body, double. What If it's spiritual confusion, maybe you've been, gone through spiritual abuse, you met someone that was a liar who claimed to be spiritual, I release a double portion of truth about who Jesus really is, who God really is, and a double portion of health throughout your body, soul, psychological, emotional, and spiritual. If it's physical, loss you've suffered physically throughout your life and you have lost so much time because of physical trauma i release double portion over you physically to come into your body right now and heal you physically and give back to you twice what you've lost because of sickness illness or disease right now in jesus name if it's financial loss over the years you've had so much stolen from you You've lost so much financially. Maybe it's bad choices, bad decisions, or you've just literally been stolen from. I release financial, double portion financially over you now in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, we have become ambassadors of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5.18, now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We're now ministers of restoration. We're ministers of the turnaround. We're ministers of the double portion because we know there's something precious inside of you. And so we're separating that from the worthless so that you can be who you really are, who you were created to be. And let me pray this prayer over you. O oh Lord, according to Psalms 90, verse 14 through 17, let the sunrise of your love end our dark night. Break through our clouded dawn again. Yes. Only you can satisfy our hearts, filling us with songs of joy to the end of our days. We have been overwhelmed with grief. Now come and overwhelm us with gladness. Yes. Replace our years of trouble with decades of delight. Yes. Let us see your miracles again. 
and let the rising generation see the glorious wonders you are famous for. Oh, Lord, our God, let your sweet beauty rest upon us. Come, work with us, and then our works will endure. Amen. You will give us success in all that we do. Amen. I just declare over you right now that as you respond to this message, as you turn back to Jesus, run back to Jesus, he will restore double to you. And we pray right now that from this day forward, as you say yes to this blessing, yes to the double portion, yes to the message you've heard today, as you embrace it and run back to Jesus and say, I am so sorry for running from you. I now run to turn back to you. I return to my first love, Jesus. I return to you. I pray now that yes. as you do that, you will have success in everything you do. And Lord, we pray this powerful blessing over everyone that listens to this message, yes. that it will become living life inside of them, yes. setting them free in ways they never dreamed possible. Yes. And Heavenly Father, Righteous Judge, I stand before you now, and I ask you and declare under your authority this now is fact in the kingdom of God. And this is all sealed, Holy Spirit, by your power and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who came in the flesh to put us back together again, no matter how broken we have been. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.